we'll be all good. So um, we're going to talk about some enumeration. Uh, this is going to be kind of a general structure of what we'll talk about. I'm going to try to keep it in an hour. Um, we might get off on a tangent. So if we don't get to things that people want to talk about, I mean, I don't have anything going on after this. I'm happy to, uh, to keep talking afterwards, uh, but we'll kind of play it by ear. So we'll start off just um, intro, talk about the group, that sort of thing. We'll talk about um, initial scanning, mostly focusing in on NMAP and just interpreting opening scans, trying to build an attack plan um, just right off the bat. We'll talk about some web, web enum, um, different tools that I like to use, and then I'm going to try to get some input from the group. If there's things that you really like and you don't see on the list, we definitely want to get those shared. Uh, once we get to section four, we'll talk about some local privilege ex ex uh, elevation stuff, uh, both Linux and Windows. Uh, we'll talk about some blind SQL injection, which is always a good time. And then we'll finish off with some tips for the OSCP exam and uh, talk about any other input people would like to add. Uh, so, right off the bat, I guess a little bit about uh, myself. I just got my OSCP in September, about halfway through the month. I've been studying in information security for about maybe eight months now. I think I started in um, in about May or uh, August-ish. Um, I currently work in health and safety, uh, all about OSHA regulations and making sure people don't get hurt on the job. And I was also an emergency medical technician for a while. So I'm gonna use some analogies that I guess come from a medical background. It's all about finding the solution as quickly as possible with uh, retaining all the information uh, necessary. And big disclaimer, I've been doing this stuff for under a year. So if you were looking for uh, advanced persistent threat techniques, you're probably in the wrong spot, but we'll uh, see how it goes. So uh, initial assessment, right off the bat, we need to get eyes on everything that we're dealing with. We need to um, see what's potentially vulnerable. And then as you kind of do this more and more, you get a feel for what's probably going to take priority, what we should be looking at versus what might be a waste of time. Uh, so kind of my standard opener, I always use Nmap, it's kind of a classic tool. Um, dash A is going to give us all the different um, scan tools that we could need. So we'll get a service scan, we'll get um, operating system, we'll get as much information as we possibly can. I like to use very verbose. Uh, so this dash VV, we want to get as much output as possible. And then I like the dash open tag just so we can kind of prioritize things that we can actually interact with. When we're doing CTF events, doing this dash P dash is going to scan every open port. It does take a while, particularly I've noticed on the Windows machines, especially in the labs. So it's going to take a bit longer, but it's going to pick up a lot of things that we are definitely going to need down the line. Um, this next segment where it's dash F dash MTU, we're actually starting to fragment packets. It's something that I don't use a whole lot when we're actually in, um, in the labs, but if you're in a realistic pen testing environment or you're actually working on a live target, this can help us evade a lot of um, intrusion detection systems and things like that because it takes a lot of processing on the back end to kind of rebuild all of those packets and get things up and running afterwards. So a lot of these things like snort rules, uh, if it notices the initial fragment, it just kind of green lights everything else and we get information that we might miss otherwise. Uh, this octet or this uh, dash MTU flag does have to be a multiple of eight. So I use 32 personal preference, people with more networking knowledge may have a better idea of why you should use a particular number, but I do not necessarily. Uh, next, obviously, is going to be the IP, which is pretty standard. And then this one is probably the most important thing that I do in any kind of assessment at this point. Um, keeping your output is the single best thing that I can recommend for anyone. Um, my first time out in the OSCP, I wasted hours just rescanning machines because I forgot to store some input. And then when I went to read or write my report, there just wasn't quite enough to, to really flesh things out. So I like OA. Um, it's going to give us an NMAP, which is just the standard NMAP output. It'll give us a greppable format, which is super convenient when we're actually uh, working on problems. And then it also gives us an XML format. And then if we look down here, uh, we see that this SLT proc, um, we can use that to 
transform this XML format into HTML, and it makes a super awesome um, browsable kind of um, HTML document. And it organizes things. It makes great screenshots and, uh, and additions for good reports. So um, does anyone have any other tricks, any other port scanners that you're fond of as opposed to Nmap? Any input that anyone would like to add? Either in chat or uh, or verbally. All right. Uh, so we will continue along. So what I was kind of thinking at this point, um, I was writing this presentation while I was working through the scavenger box on Hack the Box. So I was kind of thinking we could use the scavenger port scan and some of the uh, the steps to take during that steps of compromise as an example for this presentation. So the output that we get from uh, this scan here, I'm actually not positive that it's the exact one, but we'll get the uh, scavenger dot and that, and we'll just kind of look through it. So one of the things that I think helps a lot out in the exam kind of format is if you're wasting time looking up ports, just kind of following trails on a whim, it, you're going to waste a lot of time. So just knowing where to look and what to do right off the bat is very helpful. So right off the bat, looking at this port scan, we see we've got port 21 open, so we have an FTP server. Right off the bat, that means that I'm going to check it for anonymous access. Uh, maybe there's some files laying around. Maybe somebody's stupid and storing passwords. Who knows? Um, SSH, not a huge fan of forcing. When you're in live environments, I mean, password profiling can be really helpful. Most people out in a corporate environment are going to use the season and the year because all of the passwords are going to rotate on a 90 day cycle. So I mean, it just became fall, everyone had to update their passwords, fall 2019 is going to get you in, I don't know how much percent of the time, but with a big enough list of users, you're pretty much guaranteed a good outcome. So password spraying on any kind of SSH server is always a good option. SMTP, um, I haven't used a whole lot. I don't get a whole lot of use out of it. I know that there are tools to kind of look through it and maybe with more knowledge, it could be valuable, but I don't wait, spend a whole lot of time. This port 43 is strange right off the bat. I mean, it's got who is, um, it's talking about MariaDB, which is SQL server. So all of this seems strange, which in a CTF environment means basically gold mine. So definitely something we're gonna check out there. Port 53, anytime we see a publicly facing uh, TCP DNS server, we can kind of think maybe zone transfer, maybe something along those lines. Um, and then kind of coming back here, we also see that there's this www.supersechosting.htb. So pretty good indication of virtual hosting, maybe something along those lines. Um, let's see. Okay, auto recon for the win, for sure. I mean, I'm all about any automation. Uh, I haven't done a whole lot of it, but uh, definitely something that I'll add to the list. And then if you can maybe write up um, good options or a brief tutorial of or examples of use, that would be super helpful. Uh, so kind of get back to it. Um, any DNS tools, I like to use dig and drill. Um, I do have some slides about a little bit more specifics coming down the line with that. Uh, port 80 basic HTTP, so definitely something we're going to do a lot of inspecting on. And when we look through, we also see that we've got this super set hosting. We see who is, we see this, MariaDB. Uh, so probably something we can check out there. Uh, continuing along, we see, uh, that's, that's about it. Um, doing the dash P dash flag is what got us this dash or this port 43 open. So a standard Nmap scan would not have picked that up and we would have missed out on a key step to getting um, the our initial foothold for this box. So um, right off the bat, the goal here is once we see this initial scan, we should have a plan of attack. So looking at this, what, um, I mean, what jumps out at me, we'll do the anonymous check at port 21. Uh, we'll do a bit of enumeration at port 43, see what's going on. Um, we'll check this uh, port 80, and then we would do, we would probably add this to our hosts file. Um, I know 
IPSEC has some great videos on virtual hosting and that sort of thing. So I'm not going to go into that a whole lot. Um, but I think we'll talk a little bit more about vhost and Oom in a little bit, or Enum. All right. So getting back to the slides, interesting ports, we see we've got 21, we got 22, we got 53, we got this weird who is thing, and then we have 80. And we see kind of a general idea of just hacker instinct. This is the kind of stuff that we're looking at. Weird custom services, always a, a fun thing. Um, other juicy ports, so maybe not related to this, um, this exact box, but when I'm out, scanning things, these are things that kind of immediately jump out at me. Um, anytime we have kind of the remote windows management, especially in the hacking labs, that's always kind of an indication of maybe using evil WinRM, maybe we can get some kind of credentials that way. Um, anytime we see a port 3306, uh, there's an underlying SQL server. So Maybe we're looking at injection, that sort of stuff is always kind of a good thing to look out for. Um, Non-standard HTTP ports, especially when I've been looking out more in kind of a bug bounty kind of a setting, or I mean, if you're just doing research on Shodan, something like that, scanning open ports, non-standard HTTP ports that the general public doesn't interact with sometimes are less secure. Uh, just people figure, oh, the general public isn't going to see it. They figure security by obscurity. Nobody's come going to come and look at my stuff, so I don't need to worry about it. Uh, so maybe you find some juicy stuff out there. Uh, Webmin, there's some great exploits out for Webmin, especially if people aren't patching. I mean, there's some local file inclusion. There's remote code execution. So that's always something to check out for. And I mean, it also uses the root password of whatever service there or of whatever uh, machine they're running it on. So it's also subject to human stupidity. So we can maybe get in there as well. Uh, SMB on Windows servers, always a good thing to check out. Um, they're, I mean, if they're unpatched, definitely something that we can exploit. Um, I'm now realizing I forgot to put RDP and that sort of thing. So we can definitely use those as well. Um, I just saw a great article saying that that blue keep exploit is now being kind of um, disowned in mass, which is uh, sad for the general state of humanity, but always interesting to watch those attacks go live. Um, did want to leave an, a segment here for group additions. I know that my knowledge is by no means exhaustive, but are there any other ports that when you see them, you're thinking like, okay, this is how we're getting in. This is going to be great. Uh, does anyone want to add anything to this list? Going once. All right, uh, as I go through, uh, I'm gonna try to work on some blog posts for my own website and then maybe some stuff for our Mystico site as well. Uh, so as I go through more of these uh, hack the box challenges and other CTF events, and then once I get out into the field in my next uh, next job, I will start to, uh, to add more to those kind of cheat sheets. So um, vhost enumeration, I'm not super familiar with tools. I've tried a few of the ones that I've seen out on GitHub, but I wasn't super impressed. Uh, so I mean, if I don't need to add extra programs to my machine, I want to keep that attack surface low. So why not just stick with Nmap wherever possible? So there is a great uh, vhost enumeration script built into Nmap, um, this uh, HTTP, uh, HTTP dash vhosts. Uh, so Anytime we're doing uh, vhosts, I like to make sure we're throwing in that surface scan to get a good uh, reading of what we're looking at. Uh, so we've got nmap-sv-script uh, HTTP vhosts, and then we have our script arguments. These are not all of the script arguments, but this is kind of the basic of what you need to get things up and running. Um, we'll pull from a file list, and then we will have a base domain to uh, push against. So if we were looking at our scavenger example, when we see this um, uh, www.supersechosting.htb, um, in this instance, we would have some file li list here, whether that's out of the sec lists on GitHub. Um, I'll try to add that into the, uh, the presentation notes after the, we get this recorded and everything, um, or whatever other word list you prefer. And then we can use, um, this would be supersechosting.htb, and then we would have whatever ports those, uh, those services are running on. Uh, does anyone have 
better tooling, anything that you like to use for vhost enumeration. I'm all about the tools. All right, continuing along. Uh, DNS enum. Um, I know there are more than this. I, once again, keep it basic. I, as long as you work efficiently and you kind of know a general attack plan, I don't think you need to add a lot of things to complicate stuff. Um, I see in the hack the box forums a lot that people like drill. I don't know. I seem to have great results with dig. So just your general dig um, zone transfer. We've got um, AXFR and then we'll have our website and then the DNS server. DNS is probably one of my weaker points when it comes to uh, knowledge and enumeration. So if there are better tools, I'm definitely opening open to uh, learning about them. Uh, this is just kind of my general stuff and it's got me through uh, everything I need to use so far. Uh, next one, web enumeration. Uh, so we've got some uh, brute forcers, we've got a super basic, uh, super standard kind of general, uh, maybe vulnerability assessment tool, not sure the exact classification of Nikto. Uh, my favorite when I'm out in the labs or when I'm doing any kind of um, enumeration out in the field, uh, I do like GoBuster. Seems to be a little bit more thorough. It picks up some stuff that Derb doesn't oftentimes pick up. Um, the it does run on Go. So I mean, if you're running it on uh, Ubuntu or something like that, it does take a little bit more setup. But I think that Kali has it baked in. And I think if you are not running Buster, you can just um, get install. So it's pretty easy to set up there. Um, when you're out in the labs and that sort of thing, make sure that you're also scanning for uh, file extensions. So I think that one is going to be, let's see. Um, I think it's dash capital X. So like a standard go buster we're looking at. Um, I think depending on the version, you have to put dir scan and then we'll have dash W and whatever sec list you have. Uh, I don't know, dirs.txt. And then you'll have your URL, HTTP. Example.com, and then you can have your file extensions as well. So PHP, HTML, whatever else you need. Um, but .html, .php, .log, .text. Um, I oftentimes get a lot of great confirmation on the underlying services, version numbers, stuff like that by find, finding installs, uh, install files, uh, readme files, all of that kind of stuff is going to be really valuable when you're out in the OSCP. Uh, the more you can do to show them why you're taking an action, the better everything is going to run. So I think one of the big differences between my first exam attempt and my second exam attempt is I was able to show them exactly what was running on their machines and exactly why I made the choice to, uh, to choose a particular exploit. It takes a little bit more time, but if you spend that little bit more time to see exactly what's running, it, sh it shaves down the number of exploits you have to look at and it really uh, winds up making them more efficient in the long run. Uh, Durbuster, if you, for whatever reason, decide you're going to do everything from Windows, Durbuster is great on Windows. Uh, but I don't do a whole lot of hacking from my Windows base machine. I prefer to use, uh, I started off using the Kali Linux box. Uh, if you're out in the exam, definitely stick with the Kali Linux box just to be safe. Um, Oh, definitely dash K to ignore those uh, SSL certs. Thank you a, a lot for that one. Uh, but that's definitely something we want to add in there. Um, the Ruster works great. Um, you can use it to uh, your heart's content. And Nikto is um, not something I would use out in a live engagement, especially if you are trying to be quiet. It's a very noisy scan. Um, Sometimes I actually just like to upload monitoring tools to hack the box machines and see how attacks will look coming against it to kind of get a view of what a uh, what a blue team might look like. So that one is going to alert anyone that you're doing all kinds of bad things. So if you are on the on the lab, works great. Very kind of noisy, takes a while, but definitely a, a pretty thorough tool, and it's free, which is always great. And I was debating about adding a another tool here uh, called OpenVAS, um, called OpenVAS. 
It is an open source vulnerability assessment suite. I'm not sure what VAS stands for, but uh, pretty thorough. It is really slow. Uh, it is very thorough, so it's going to pick up on a lot of stuff. Uh, pretty cool thing to take a look at. It's a nice thing to throw on. I know that when I was starting to, uh, to interview for the latest job I was applying for, uh, they wanted to know about potentially like what vulnerability scanners I'm familiar with. And I mean, I don't have the budget to go out and buy Nessus or whatever these, I don't know, massive tools are. But OpenVast can give you a good framework. It can kind of get you familiar with those sort of tools without breaking the bank. It's totally free. Uh, and it does make a great, a nice asset. It was cool to kind of run out in the labs in, um, in the offensive security labs just to see things that maybe I was inexperienced in or I had missed when I was out. And then I could go out and um, and see how I could organically find those vulnerabilities without a big tool like that. Um, so at this point, I guess we can talk about some local enumeration scripts. Um, I was thinking about maybe, I don't know how to do that organically. Maybe after the presentation, we can kind of talk about a box to go look at, and then we can kind of enumerate it as a group and kind of see everyone's thinking process and that sort of thing, because I think that would be really valuable. Uh, so for now, we're just going to kind of get to local enumeration scripts and uh, and get through uh, just how we can see uh, how we can get more power on the box. So right off the bat, probably not something you'll use very much out in the um, OSCP exam. And it's something that doesn't really get me a whole lot of success uh, very often, but maybe you get more success than I've had. Uh, Metasploit local exploit suggester, always a good option. Uh, something that you should run in both 36-bit uh, or 32-bit and 64-bit if you can. Um, they do tend to scan differently and maybe they pick up things that wouldn't otherwise. Uh, Linux prepchecker.py, I'm going to put the links to these um, in some kind of show notes, presentation notes, something like that, just so everybody can have this if they uh, if they need to find it. Um, Linux prepchecker is probably my, my most common one. Python's going to be on most machines. They also do have... Um, bash versions. So it's pretty versatile, something that's going to pick up a lot of things that we're looking for. Um, it does break down a lot of different varieties of privilege ex ex uh, escalation. Sorry, um, It's going to find uh, sticky bit um, misconfigurations, all kinds of stuff like that. So definitely something to go through there. If you are just getting into this sort of thing, it looks really overwhelming at the beginning. Um, Got Milk has a great tutorial that basically I had open every time I was trying to elevate privileges on any machine for the first six months that I was uh, actually studying this stuff. So I think it's Got Milk. I, I don't know how he spells it. I'll find a link and then I'll, I'll add it in afterwards so everybody can have it. Um, but definitely a good thing to read. I know there's a variety of it for Windows as well. It's a great tutorial for that sort of thing. Um, so definitely something to look into and I'll get you those links afterwards. Uh, Linenum.sh, definitely a good option as well. It does very similar things to Linux Proof Checker, but maybe it'll pick up something else. And then on the Windows side, JAWS is great. Um, it's going to pick up things like unquoted service paths. Uh, that is definitely something that I would be familiar with for the OSCP. Um, I'm pretty sure that I rooted at least one of the Windows boxes with it, so definitely something to check out there. Uh, pretty easy to use. Uh, there's some great tutorials up on its GitHub, and I'll include links for that, uh, that, that afterwards. And then we have the PowerSploit from, I want to say it's the PowerShell Mafia, which is just a kick-ass name right off the bat. Um, definitely something to check out. They've got PowerUp in there. There's some other privilege exploit x uh, elevation or maybe someday i'll learn how to say that uh privilege elevation um, services in there there are i mean there's a whole tab called mayhem where you can just kind of screw with the uh, target machine so pretty sweet thing there um this gtfopens.github.io 
uh, my understanding is it is just a list of things that you can exploit to get better privileges or do cool stuff with. So definitely something to check out. I haven't got a whole lot of experience with it. I've seen some people post in the forums about it, and I'm pretty sure that anytime I see that, it just means that I was working way harder than I need to in the labs. Uh, so definitely something that I'm going to do more research on and start to try to incorporate to my own uh, methodology. Uh, but not necessarily an expert with that one just yet. And then this one is just payload all the things. It is a near comprehensive list of privilege exp elevation stuff. Um, I just found this today prepping this uh, these slides. So I'm going to spend probably the next week reading through this entire list and trying to master as much of it as I can. Uh, but it seems like if you are looking to elevate privileges, the method is probably on this list somewhere. So definitely worth uh, worth checking that one out as well. All right, um, so this is kind of what I was most excited for. SQL injection is um, something that I have known about for years and I had no idea how like in depth it can get. It is simultaneously the simplest thing that I've done in hacking and also the most frustrating and tedious thing, uh, but really, really cool when it finally works. Um, I have seen a lot of these error-based and union-based tutorials. So I mean, the select, union select and that sort of thing, we can definitely get into afterwards. We can spend probably a few more talks on, uh, but there's a lot of information out there. Uh, blind SQL injection is a cool thing that I was a little bit unfamiliar with and I think it's really valuable. I've actually just been able to use it in kind of a bug bounty format and I wound up finding a uh, database full of like 700,000 plain text passwords. So that's always a good time. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and these are kind of just the, uh, the basic steps way oversimplified. Uh, first we need to find an injection place. So just throw apostrophes into every single form you could possibly find. Um, the more the better. Um, if you see an equal sign, a question mark, parameter equals, throw apostrophes, something in there, try to break it, see what goes down. Um, once we can break it, we need to try to complete the query without any errors. So we can start actually injecting our own code. And if we can get true false statements, then we can ask questions, then magic happens, and we wind up with profit. So um, I'm thinking, is anyone opposed? Is anyone currently working on Scavenger and you're going to be really upset with me if I kind of do a walkthrough of the initial foothold? Speak now or forever hold your peace. All right, I'm going to do my very best to make this very educational. I don't want to work too fast. I don't want to like spoil anything. Um, in my current job, I actually do education and stuff like that. So I'm going to do my best to, uh, to keep this very, very cool and very awesome for everyone. And we'll kind of walk through it together. So let's pull up my notes. All right. So when we were looking at this initial scan, um, right off the bat, I was not familiar with this kind of an exploit prior to doing this machine. I had a bit of experience, but usually I was just like, let's just bust out SQL map. Why waste my time? I don't need to figure all this stuff out, but decided this was probably a better idea. We could um, get a little bit more detailed, maybe um, learn some new things here. So we've got this port 43 who is, but it is talking about MariaDB. So that does mean SQL underlying server, something we can interact with. I think that I'm connected. Actually, I should hopefully, <laughs> I should have probably prepared this before I got into anything. Uh, we're going to see if maybe the box is already up. Otherwise, I'm going to have to queue it up and we can do our live demo. I always see on the DEF CON talks like, oh, live demos are cursed. They're never going to work. Something's going to go wrong. And I'm like, I do live, pre live presentations every single day in my life. This is going to be fine. And of course, it was turned off. All right, so uh, hopefully that boots on quickly. It's one of the Linux boxes, so it should. So we'll see NC dish NV, just um, netcat. I know there's encrypted versions, and I would use those when I'm out in the field, but this will be fine. Uh, we'll give it the IP address, 155, and we'll say we're going to connect to port 43. And it has not. Oh. Nope, it's not going to kick on yet. Where's my? Yeah, I'm connected. 
we'll see. We'll give that a second, but we'll go back and we'll look at the notes and kind of uh, preface all of this. So um, when we're dealing with kind of error-based or if we can get some actual visual feedback back from the SQL database, this makes things much easier. You know, if we can just put in, I don't know, if the user, if the database is like, and then a bunch of blank spaces, and it just gives us all the information we want, fantastic. Uh, but it, maybe in some cases, we don't get visible feedback. We can't actually ask and get good answers to our question. But if we can get some form of remote code execution, if we can get something to change in the database and maybe we can time it or we can see some other value change, then we can start to answer um, true false questions. And if we can get that, we can basically get all of the information out of the database. So when we get this up and running, hopefully it happens sooner than later. There we go. Um, so when we just do an initial look at what's happening, you type in something, it gives us a little banner. That's basically what we saw in our nmap scan. So not a whole lot going on. This query returned to zero objects. Um, I struggled this with this for way longer than I would like to admit. I was probably typing stuff into this field for, I don't know, an hour and a half. And then right at the end when I was ready to give up, I just tried one apostrophe and boom we get an error message. So we see that uh, we have a, uh, a problem with our syntax near, I mean, we just put in one apostrophe and it's showing two, which is strange. Honestly, I'm not an expert in this, so I'm not familiar with why there's two. Uh, but we also see there's a parentheses and then we have a limit one and another apostrophe. So not something that is great for us, but we can probably find a way to work around that. So our first priority needs to be fixing that error and then we can start to inject our own code. Uh, the easiest way is we can try to recreate this um, parentheses limit one, and then we can try to comment, comment out the rest of the string. So that code basically just becomes ignored. So, I mean, looking at my notes, you can probably see where this is going, but if we go parentheses or an apostrophe, and then we throw in a parentheses space limit one, and then we do a, um, a hash mark. I know there's a really cool name that starts with an O, um, but your pound sign or whatever. Um, now we get a clean return. So we have successfully closed the query and we can probably start to do some magic in here. So what we're gonna start to do is we're going to include, um, we're gonna try to get something executed for us. Uh, we're going to try, I don't know, let's see if we can just get a standard always true uh, statement to execute. So we'll say one or one equals one, and then we'll try to close this again. So we've got limit one. So, so far we've got our apostrophe to break the string. Uh, we have or one equals one, which will always be true. And we're closing those parentheses, and then we have our limit one um, pound sign. So we now have completed a valid query. And we know we can kind of inject some Boolean value. We can maybe start to pull some information out, but we don't see any information returned, which is a huge problem. You know, if we can ask yes or no questions and it could tell us yes or no, great. But as it stands, we can't do anything with this. But what we can do is we can make these uh, underlying databases go to sleep. And if we can ask a valid yes or no question and tie that answer to a sleep query, then if the database sleeps, we know we have a valid piece of information. So let's see if we can get the valid sleep query. And there's a lot of good, or there are some good tutorials. They're kind of wordy. The formatting is super weird. So I kind of put my notes together here wherever I could, uh, but I'll try to get those together for you guys as well. I'll get a little bibliography going. Uh, so apostrophe or, and then we can go sleep and we'll say sleep, we'll say five because it feels like it takes forever if you go higher than five. And then we'll close out this query again, limit one, and we see that it's gone to sleep. So we can successfully get a valid query into the database and we can potentially start to pull some information out. So 
we need some information. I mean, ideally we would get all the information. If we had SQL map, we just fire it away. I saw in the forums that there's actually a way to get SQL map running on this problem, but apparently that person is smarter than I am. Uh, I had to do it the manual way, but I thought it was very rewarding and I learned a lot while I was doing it. So um, we can start to get things like the name of the database. So when we look at queries like this, we're seeing we're breaking the query and then, or we're selecting sleep. So we're gonna make the query sleep if there is a database with the name like this. And this percent sign is a wild card. So if the database has a name like anything, we're gonna get a valid sleep or we should get a valid sleep. Um, unless something has changed since I did this last, let's fire this away and see if we can get uh, a sleep. And we do. So the database has a name, which seems <laughs> self-explanatory, but we can leverage this to start pulling better information out. Now, this uh, percent sign is a wild card for any character and I believe any length stream. So if it has a name of any length, we're gonna get a valid return here. When we get a little bit more fine-tuned, I guess I already wrote this out mostly, when we get a little bit deeper with these queries, we can start to use a combination of underscores and percentage and then we can start to get the length of the database and we can start to pull more detailed names or uh, more detailed information. So in the interest of time uh, we're just going to kind of keep on keeping on. Um, how we would check the length of the database is we can give it uh, apostrophe or and then start throwing in our queries. Select. I don't think I need all of this capitalized but I do it anyway. Um, and then we'll say sleep for five and then from dual. And I'm not super familiar with this dual table. My understanding is it's a pseudo table that's present in all of the kind of MySQL databases and it's used for testing and things like that. I'm not super familiar, but very useful for us in this instance. Uh, from dual where database name is like, and then we can throw in quotations, we'll start to kind of enumerate the length of the string naming the database. So if we wanted to be, I don't know, we can say, does it have more than three characters? So we can do three underscores and then our, our um, percent sign, and then we can close our quotations, we'll close our parentheses, and then we'll close our string. And we'll throw in that. So it does have more than three characters. Now from here, we're basically just doing trial and, and error. If we get the sleep return, I'm sure that there's a way to script this. I actually just started kind of studying Python a little bit more seriously. So I may try to go back through and make an automated process for this, uh, but doing it manual, learned a lot about how this uh, kind of fine tuning stuff works. So we do a bit of trial and error and we can see that the database has a name that is five characters. From here, we can start substituting in the actual characters and down the line, we would find that this database is named who is. Now that we have a little bit more information about the actual database name, we can start querying more information. Uh, we can start looking in other common tables or other common areas in the database. So like information schema dot tables, uh, and then we can say where table schema equals database. So that's gonna select our who is database. And then we can say, oh, column name like percent. So if it has a column name at all, and then we're closing out this kind of string here. Once again, I'm going to find us all the, uh, the tutorials that I looked at specifically. And then we can see again, we're selecting um, table names and that sort of thing that have any kind of information. Um, using these kind of queries, just through trial and error, it's going to take a while, but we can get through it. Eventually, we do find columns named domain, we find tables named customers, like this winds up becoming very valuable over time. Once again, takes forever, but very, very useful. Down through this process, we wind up using these commands to pull all of the, all of the column names. We can pull all of the, we can pull all of the 
table names, we can pull every piece of information out of this, uh, this database just using sleep commands. And it's going to take forever because they're sleeping. But as long as you're smart about uh, looking through, I usually try to pull database name. Then I'll try to pull column names um, if I can and try to go from there. You can even do things like where column name or where database is like, and then the name of the website. So instead of pulling from information schema or in, in, in um, I don't know, standard MySQL, you're getting things that are specific to that site. Maybe they have more things like customer data. Maybe it's going to be a little bit more value valuable for us. Um, so try to be intelligent. Try to think about how somebody setting up a database would organize their stuff. And then we can maybe get a little bit of a jump on them. Um, I'm not going to go too far down this list because the uh, scavenger machine was actually probably my favorite out of any I have done so far. So if you are working on it, fantastic. If you're not, uh, definitely give it a try. I was kind of nervous because it's all red and scary looking and stuff, but uh, definitely worth taking a look. All right. Um, any questions on anything so far? Preferably about hacking, but I do know other things. All right, uh, so we're actually making pretty good time. Um, we're gonna kind of finish off with some tips for the OSCP exam. And I think I may have even talked about some of these throughout the presentation so far, uh, but just things that I think helped me a lot. Right off the bat, save everything. Um, if you think it's interesting, if you think someone else might think it's interesting, if you don't think it's interesting, just make sure you have some evidence of it. Um, I my first exam attempt, I got enough machines. I was probably, I probably had 80 points-ish. Um, I didn't get full root on two boxes, but I was doing pretty well. I was absolutely exhausted. I passed out thinking like, I barely scraped through. I'm going to make it my first try. I was stoked. I wake up the next day and I didn't have screenshots that I needed. I didn't have the uh, proof files that I needed. So there was like a brief moment where I thought, you know what, I have screenshots of that num of like the hash that they used for their proof file. I could try to recreate that proof file and then like sneak in a screenshot. It was a nightmare. Don't even try to do something like that. These people deal with clever people trying to hack through their exam all the time. Just be honest, just get through it. It is what it is. The second time I went through, every single meaningful step, I took a screenshot. I made sure to compile every output from every scan I could. If there is a write to out file, use it always. Just make sure you have everything. And as long as you go in with a game plan, and as long as you kind of remain calm, there's plenty of time to get through all the boxes. I mean, if you're doing stuff regularly on Hack the Box, you have the skill level required. It genuinely is like, when I finished the lab time, I thought, okay, I'm going to go do Hack the Box to kind of brush up on my skills, maybe learn a couple things that I didn't know already. And as soon as I got out into the lab, I was terrified because all of the Hack the Box machines are so much harder than what I did on the OSCP labs. I mean, there was maybe a few boxes that were comparable, but most of them in Hack the Box are significantly more difficult. So if you can make it in Hack the Box, or if even you're struggling in Hack the Box, you still may very well have the skills required to pass OSCP. Um, people say it's a beginner cert. I think there's a lot of people who debate that. I absolutely agree that it is. I mean, I had zero tech experience prior to studying for that exam. I did a little bit, like I took a scratch programming class in like middle school or something. And that's like drag and drop. You don't even code like it was a joke. I did a little bit of Python and then I tried to do an online C++ course. And then I came and did this and I mean, I went through the lab material and I mean, I worked my ass off. Like any time that I was not working, I was in my, uh, at my laptop cranking away. So, but it's definitely doable. Like if you're willing to put in the time, and I mean, they say right off the bat, you're going to have to try harder. You're going to, I mean, you should have an unreasonable tolerance for pain and suffering. And I mean, they're not joking, but this is by no means the hardest thing I've done. And it absolutely is doable. So, I mean, anybody who's going to try to gatekeep it and say like, no, you can't do it. Like 
you have to be super smart. You have to do all this. If you're willing to put in the time and you just keep trying, that is the only thing that you have to do. So just keep at it. You're going to get there. It's going to suck, but you're going to get there. Um, as long as you're managing your time well in the lab or in the exam, you should be fine. I mean, it's five boxes and 24 hours. That is more than four hours per box if you absolutely have to use your whole time. You know, I guess they say it's 23 hours and 45 minutes, but like you can totally do it. It's more than enough time as long as you're saving your scans, as long as you're compiling your output, and as long as you're not getting stuck in rabbit holes. And I mean, there definitely are rabbit holes. The first time that I was in the lab, I got stuck on this thing trying to compile an exploit for a specific service. And I mean, they left it there like it was guaranteed that that was the privilege exploit ex, uh, elevation. So, I mean, they're going to try to trick you, but run your enumeration strip, scripts. Like if I had JAWS out in the labs the first time I was going through, yeah, it's five boxes. So for OSCP, for the, for the low level cert, it's five boxes. It's definitely not 10. Um, and I mean, it's two, I think it's, two 25 point boxes. One of those is gonna be your buffer overflow. And then they have like a few lower point boxes. Personally, I was super stressed out about the buffer overflow, but it was not that bad. I mean, it's, <laughs> um, if you've done safe in Hack the Box, you are gonna laugh when you walk into the, to the exam and see the buffer overflow. Yeah, buffer overflow is free points. Personally, I did it, uh, I did it last both times. Make sure you're not too tired because like it is easy, but it is very detailed. So just make sure you can uh, pay attention enough. Like uh, when I did it last on the second exam, I was like exhausted and it was a little bit more difficult than it needed to be. But basically I was thinking like that's something that I know I can do no matter what. So I want to have as much time to deal with the things that I'm really going to grapple with first. And then I can coast through the finish line and get the, just slam dunk those easy points. So hey, hey, I got a question. Sure. Sorry. Um, so that's something I've been thinking about for the next, for my next exam is mm -hmm. leaving the buffer overflow to last just because I can attack the boxes that can actually cause me problems when I'm freshest. So you think yeah. that's a good idea? That's, that was my strategy. I kind of started my exam when I knew I was going to be at my best. And then I just went straight for that 25 point box. And I figured if I can get that, then it's just going to get easier as I get more fatigued and it, it'll kind of match my level of, of energy. Did, did you uh, pull off the quote unquote uh, impossible 10? What is that? Uh, the 10 pointer. Oh, I rooted all the boxes. Yeah. So I wound up getting full compromise on all the machines and it was great. Any other questions, comments so far? Fantastic. One of the best pieces of advice that I saw out uh, just kind of doing general research. Um, yeah, totally avoid Metasploit. I don't know if I used it much. I think that I deployed it, but I wound up not even needing it. So I mean, when I was in the labs, I think that I over relied on Metasploit. And I'm really glad that I made the transition to Hack the Box before I actually took the exam because Metasploit is not super useful in Hack the Box. I mean, people... I, I have... Uh... Hello, uh, I have yeah. a stupid question, I think. Oh, no, go for uh, it. Okay, so uh, the course about, about uh, buffer overflow in the OSCP and the PWK courses, is enough to get hands on the buffer overflow until we can like make it in the exam, just reading and practicing in the, uh, in the course lab, or uh, we have to check some other resources to, to learn more? The course material should be plenty. Um, they have a few really good examples, tutorials through there. And then as you're going through the OSCP uh, course material, they have a few exercises where they break it down very easily. And if you go through that, that's plenty of information. If you also do other ones, fantastic but it's pretty basic. It's basically like you're going to have one input value that you can overrun something and you're going to put space for your shell code and point to the shell code. It's not any kind of ASLR bypass. There's no, um, no execute. There's no wrap chaining, anything like that. It's very, very basic 32-bit buffer overflow. Um, one okay, thing about thank you. Uh -huh. um, I put a link in the, in the group chat. 
if if for some reason you have any issues at all during the exam or anything, you could go to this little link, pull up the PDF, and just follow it step by step. And I 100% guarantee you, if you check multiple types of shells, you pop calculate later first, you check bind and reverse shells just to make sure, um, and you try to use a jump ESP that's part of the program that you're exploiting, you'll you'll probably be able to. You know, I can pretty much guarantee you'll get in. Perfect. Yeah, it's genuinely that was one of my biggest concerns because I was like, I don't know any advanced exploit writing. Like I don't get wrap chains, that kind of stuff. I was super stressed, got out into the lab and laughed at it. Like I was honestly disappointed because I wanted to have a harder buffer overflow to play around with. So that part, probably not as scary as it needs to be. Definitely don't underestimate it. I mean, if you're not familiar with the basics, definitely get the basics down, but that's all you need. Um, this next point about GCC is probably one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got. When you're first doing your local enumeration on the box, once you get that initial foothold, check if there are compiling tools. If there um, any kind of like GNU compiler, um, any of that kind of stuff, if it's present on a box or the, or the Windows equivalent, if it's present on a box out in the lab, it probably means you're gonna be uploading files, you're gonna be compiling exploits, and it's gonna be something kernel level, it's gonna be something like that. If there aren't those, you're probably looking at security misconfigurations. So it's not gonna be universal, but it definitely gave me a better idea of what I should be looking for. And I think it's it kind of trimmed down the rabbit holes that I was paying attention to. And once again, your enum scripts are super useful. Definitely use your, um, definitely use JAWS. Um, I know I see people use Sherlock and stuff like that. I haven't had a, much experience with it. I'm not quite sure what it does, but I know there are other uh, PowerShell enumeration scripts to look into. Um, I'll try to get like a list of tools that I've seen come up uh, throughout my experience. Uh, yeah, Sherlock. Okay, perfect. So that's what I was talking about. Um, I didn't get a whole lot of use out of that. I haven't seen a whole lot of like just outright when I was in the OSCP exam, it was like I saw a fully patched Windows 10 box and basically shit myself. <laughs> like it was uh, very stressful, but like just keep at it. You're, you're going to get through it. It initially looks intimidating, but there, there is a way through it. There is an answer. And if you keep your cool, you'll, you'll find it eventually. This next or almost to last point very important. I feel like such an idiot because the first time I took my exam, I should have passed and I forgot or I forgot some screenshots. My screenshot button on my laptop wasn't quite working and I wound up not passing the exam because I didn't have proof. Screenshot all of the meaningful steps. Now I didn't have, I've heard some people say like, oh, set some automated thing to take a screenshot every second, five seconds, 10 seconds, compress them down, store it that way. Uh, maybe you do. Maybe you find some things that you might need. Personally, I think that's overkill. As long as you're being intentional with what you're doing, as long as you are thinking about the steps that you are taking, you should be fine. So basically, what my strategy was is I start off with my initial assessment. So I'm going to do my port scans. And then if I find open web surfaces, services, that sort of stuff, I'll do some directory scans. So I'll bust out GoBuster, or I'll bust out Derb, whatever. And then I'll figure out where I'm going. If there are any kind of specific services, I know that in the OSCP labs, they talk a lot about a, a Firefox plugin called Wappalizer. It'll show you the underlying technology of, this, uh, of the website. Um, if you see anything that sticks out, if you see anything on that list, try to find its install file. So just type in whatever website slash install.txt or readme.md, whatever, try to find those files. Because if they have a version number, you plug that into ExploitDB and boom, you've got your exploit, you've got your foothold, and then half the time you're, you're halfway there. So make sure you're doing those initial steps. They want to see Basically, they want to see how you're going to operate on a live target in a work environment. Like, they want to make sure that you can do this for a customer and provide them a service that is valuable. So you want to know exactly why you're running an exploit so that when you're sitting down with the, I don't know, CISO, whoever, 
you're not saying like, oh yeah, I saw this and it looked cool. So I fired some random exploit at your company and hoped that it worked because that is not going to go over well. But if you say, this is the exact service you were running, this is where I found it, this is why I thought this way, and this is exactly the tailoring that I did to the exploit to make it work perfectly, they're going to sit back and they're going to respect you. So make sure you have proof. Make sure you can explain why you're deciding to do a specific thing. And remember, they're logging everything on their end. So they can tell when you're just shooting blanks. So take screenshots. I think I saw this from... Um, our fearless leader of our, our team. Um, imagine your ancient grandma is reading your report and is going to have to basically go be, go in after you and recompromise this machine. Um, I think that most blue teamers are significantly smarter than I am. I think that they have many more things to worry about. And I basically like, they build this perfect glass castle and I come in with a sledgehammer and just smash the shit out of it. And I feel terrible. But like, imagine that the person who's going to have to read your report just learned how to turn on a computer. So you need them to be able to go in and take every single step. And that's the level of detail you need in your report. And like, finally, I think the thing that has helped me most, not only in now getting a job in information security, but also just in general, be professional. Like the title of this certificate is Offensive Security Certified Professional. So when you write that report, you're not saying like, haha, I owned them. You're not saying like, wow, this is stupid. You're saying these are the things that need to be improved on. This is the way that this can affect your security posture. These are the big vulnerabilities. But like, I, um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. And one of the big ones that I listen to is uh, the Social Engineering Podcast. And it's really big on like leaving the customer better than you found them. Like if you come in and you just talk to your client and you just walk around, and it's like, ha, lol owned, that's not valuable to anyone. Your goal is to provide value for the client and to help them secure their system so that the bad guy doesn't come in and fuck them over. So like you need to write a report that not only they can use, but they're going to value and they're going to be able to take actionable steps on. So, I mean, my basic report was these are the steps of compromise. This is exactly the steps that I took, and this is why it worked. So these are immediate steps you can take, whether that is implementing a patching program, these are the links to the patch for this exact service. Or maybe it's this service doesn't actually have a fix at all, so you need to find an entirely separate option. Who knows? And sometimes the client's going to come back and say, you know what, this is business critical. I cannot swap this out. So you're going to have to get creative and help them find a better solution. But ultimately, like you are a service for them. You are a tool. I mean, I did martial arts growing up and we used to spar. And like there were some kids that we would go into the ring and they would just beat the fuck out of me. And like, I, I didn't learn anything from that. It was not fun for me. They had a great time because they're all big and strong, but that's not valuable. Like when you're going into these engagements, you're going to be sparring. You're going to be learning from each other. Like they're going to help you learn your skills better and you're going to help them secure their stuff better. So make sure that you bring that into your write-ups. Make sure you bring that into your interactions and that sort of thing. And I mean, prior to today, I actually thought that I was just going to be talking out of my ass, not having any idea what I was talking about. But I just, as of today, got a formal offer from a pen testing company. So hopefully by next week, I will be able to say I am a professional pen tester. So I mean, realistically, to anybody who is looking for some encouragement, looking for like a better job, whatever, I currently am working like 60 to 80 hours a week teaching. Like I, I enjoy my job, but I commute six to like four to six hours a day. Absolute fucking nightmare. Been doing this stuff on the side, trying to study as much as I can, get through it as best as I can. I took, I think, three months of lab time because I knew that I didn't have enough time to actually devote it and give it the time that it deserved. So just any time that I wasn't out working, I was basically in front of the computer working through that lab. After that, I spent maybe two, three months going through my, um, going through Hack the Box, trying to learn as much as possible, got involved with this team, and that helped a ton. Just ask people questions, try to get hints. Don't let people solve problems for you. Uh, learn why they're thinking about what they're doing. Talk to people, ask questions. Um, and then after two, three months in Hack the Box, I signed up for my exam, took my first attempt, 
failed because I was an idiot, took the second one about two weeks later, passed, and then I changed my LinkedIn profile, put in my new skills, gave a little bit about my work experience, and I mean, none of it is tech related. Everything up until this point is all medicine, it's all like customer service, which I mean is helpful. I can talk to people, but it's not related to this. I had one technical interview, the recruiter contacted me, I had one technical interview, and now I've got the job. So, I mean, if you put in the time and you're willing to really devote the effort, you can totally make it. Like this is, I was honestly surprised at how simple this has been. I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's definitely something that's doable. And I think at this point we are, let's see, where are we at? Oh, it's six on the dot. That was perfect. Um, so that is uh, what I had prepared. We can kind of open it up if anyone wants to, uh, do other things if you guys just want to go hack some shit i'm down uh, but at this point if you have other more important things to get back to you're more than welcome to um any questions anything anyone wants to add anything. hey uh, if you could go over a little bit on your methodology of avoiding rabbit holes that's the primary reason i uh i failed my last two attempts so any any advice on that methodology for what avoiding rabbit holes avoiding rabbit holes um, I try to, I try to limit my time on it. So like if, if I'm trying the exact same thing for like 15 plus minutes, I'm going to try something else, or I'm going to go back and try to find something to confirm my hunch. And that was something that I struggled with a lot in my first exam attempt. But once I got the, once I really went in and I found all of those like install files and I really got the version numbers and all of that kind of ironed out, I was able to kind of weed those out a little bit more effectively. Um, I mean, when I'm out in the hack the box labs, it definitely still happens. And I mean, rabbit holes are rabbit holes, especially if you start getting familiar with a particular attack vector or something. Like I have had great success with LFI to remote file inclusion to remote code execution. So anytime I see something like that, like I'm going to spend too much time there. So Developed as things for lack of with all of the kind of like exploit format, you get better at tooling them up right and knowing when it's not just, oh, I don't know how to make this work as opposed to this just isn't going to work. Um, so I think over time it gets better, but really confirming version numbers, really getting detailed, knowing exactly what the exploit is doing so that when it runs, you can confirm that yes, this is something I should spend more time on, or no, this is a waste of time. It's not even doing the things that it needs to do. Um, I think that also, especially if you're doing like web exploits, something that I did not do enough of prior to my exam, uh, watch what it's doing through a packet sniffer, like put it through burp, make sure that you're really watching the control flow and getting a good idea of the underlying processes as well. Does anyone have things to add? I feel like that's probably one of the most valuable questions that anyone could any ever ask. Like, I have wasted hours of my life in rabbit holes. And if anyone else has better strategies, I'm definitely open, and open to hearing them. All right. Well, I think that is, uh, that's all I've got. Um, I'm going to be around for the evening. I mean, if you want to hit me up on uh, Telegram, if you want to hit me up on Discord, whatever, uh, definitely open to helping. Um, I think that there's a great quote about this uh, jazz musician, like one of the best trumpet players on the entire planet. And the way that he got to be the best is he thought every single person, every single musician had something to teach him. Uh, even though he was the best on the planet, he would take like a beginner and say that they probably knew something that he didn't know how to do. So if you have a cool trick, if you have something that you think is neat, something that you just learned today, this week, whatever, shoot me a message on Telegram. Tell me something cool that's going on. You know, I'm always about the, uh, the new information. So um, go forth, hack the planet. Uh, hope everybody enjoyed the, uh, the session. And um, yeah, keep up the good work.